Hi, this is Paul. Here's a little clip from one of the recent Jordan Peterson Q&A, Does Life Have Meaning Without God? And I think, again, he's given his consistent answer, and, well, he, it's quite succinct here, so I'll let it play, and then I'll talk a little bit about it. Does life have meaning without God? Can life be meaningful without God and without eternity? Well, <clears throat> At the highest and most abstract levels, perhaps not. So, I mean, life has proximal meanings, right? There's the meaning that you experience when you're engaged in a piece of art, or when you're reading, or when you're engrossed in a movie, or in a conversation. There's the meaning that emerges within your relationships with people that you cherish, or are enthusiastic with. There's meanings of security and predictability. Uh, there's meanings of duty and responsibility and active engagement with your job and your career. Uh, there's meanings of aesthetic pleasure. Now, all of those have their value and each of them has their place. And you know, maybe there's a hierarchy of value there as well, so that some of those meanings are deeper than others. And then you might say, well, what characterized the deepest of all meanings? And it would be something like relationship with the transcendent, and that would establish a relationship between you and what's always been conceptualized as God, which is generally supposed to be something ineffable, right? It, it's not definable, but you might think about it as the central animating spirit of the age or the value around which all other values are organized, or the wisdom of the ages, or the creative spirit that possesses you when you're inspired, or what grips you with enthusiasm at a sports event or at a musical event, all of those things. And we need a relationship with that. And we find our deepest meaning in that relationship. And if we don't find it, I think if we don't find it in something that's explicitly religious, then we tend to magnify something of lesser value, say something political, into that to fill the void. So yes, life has proximal meanings without God, without eternity, but at the ultimate level, something's lacking. And it's the desire to fulfill that lack that and maybe the lack itself that's part and parcel of the religious instinct. So you can kill God, but you can't. That doesn't rectify the hunger for God. And then that hunger seeks out replacements. That's how it looks to me. I think that's a terrific answer. I'm going to go back through it and then do commentary on it because I know some of you don't like it when I interrupt him. So I give him a chance to talk and next time I'll interrupt him plenty. But there's a lot of God number one and God number two-ness in that answer. And for those of you who are unfamiliar or my God number one, God number two idea is still unclear, I got that idea listening to the Sam Harris-Jordan Peterson conversation and it became very apparent that Sam Harris and Jordan Peterson were talking about two different things because at the end of Jordan talking about his description of what he means by God, Sam Harris said, oh, that's not what anybody else means by God. And it's unfortunate that that was at the end of the conversation because I think, I thought Brett Weinstein did a, did a, good, did a good job of sort of helping them explain each other to each other during a conversation, which was good. But they could have used more time to go into what each of them meant by God. Now, what's interesting about this question is that this question very much talks more about God number two than God number one. Okay, what do I mean by God number one and God number two? God number one, Jordan Peterson's God, as he explained it to Sam Harris, is an imminent God in many ways. Is I've talked a lot about the framework of, oh, where's the book? Okay. Um, Ezekiel Kaufman's framework when he distinguishes paganism from, he's, he's a Jewish scholar, from the, the God of the Bible. 
and notes that in paganism, you can find this in um, Christine, ooh, what's her last name? Is it Klein? No. Uh, I'll put the link below. But but the metadivine realm. And the God of Israel is in place of this agent arena relationship in which the gods of the ancient world are agents and the arena is this metadivine realm. And there were various attempts in antiquity to try to sort of agentify or personify the power of the metadivine realm, which is always over. Well, maybe I'll just, Christine Hayes, maybe I'll just play some of that in this video just for clarity because I get this question a lot. So let's turn then to Kaufman's description of the fundamental distinction between the polytheistic worldview and the revolutionary monotheistic worldview that took root in Israel. And um, I am going to be rehearsing and then critiquing the arguments that are in that 100-page reading that I assigned for you this week. This is the only time something like this will happen in the course. And I do that because these ideas are so fundamental and we are going to be wrestling with them throughout the course. So it's important to me that you absorb this stuff right from the beginning and think about it and be critical of it and, and engage it. Um, Kaufman's ideas are very important. They're also overstated in some ways, and that's why we're going to be wrestling with some of these ideas throughout the course. So let's begin with Kaufman's characterization of what he calls pagan religion. Right? That's the term that he uses. The fundamental idea of pagan religion, he says, and I quote, the idea that there exists a realm of being prior to the gods and above them, upon which they depend and whose decrees even they must obey, the meta-divine realm. This is the realm of supreme and ultimate power, and it transcends the deities. All right? The deity or the deities emerge from and are therefore subject to the laws of the meta-divine <coughs> realm, the forces and powers of the meta-divine realm. And the nature of this realm will vary from pagan tradition to pagan tradition. It might be water, it might be darkness, it might be spirit. Or in um, ancient Greek religion, um, a more sort of philosophical polytheism, it might be fate. Even the gods are subject to the decrees of fate. They have no control. You, you can see with fate in the Greeks that the gods are subject to fate. What that means that the gods are beneath fate. And then when you represent and personify the fates, well, now you've basically attempted to represent and personify the metadivine realm. But then the question is, well, does that undercut the metadivine realm? Does that undercut the agent arena relationship? Over that. Kaufman asserts, therefore, this, this belief, once you posit a primordial realm, some realm that is beside or beyond the gods, that's independent of them and primary, you have automatically limited the gods. So what I've done is I've spelled out here for you consequences, logical consequences of, of positing a meta-divine realm. You know, once you have a meta-divine realm, all of these things are going to follow. The gods are going to be limited. All right? They are not the source of all. They are bound by, they're subservient to this meta-divine realm. There can therefore be no notion of a supreme divine will, an absolute or sovereign divine will. The will of any one god ultimately can be countered by the decrees of the primordial realm, and the will, the will of all the gods can be thwarted by the decrees of the primordial realm. The will of any one god can be thwarted by perhaps another uh, god. All right? So the gods are limited in power. They're also limited in their wisdom. Right? That falls under this as well. They're not going to be all-knowing or, or, or all-wise because of the existence of this realm that's beyond them and which is in many ways mysterious to them as well. It's unpredictable to them too. It's not in their control or in their power. Once you understand this, a whole bunch of things come into play. I mean, there's always the village atheist question where, for example, can God make a rock so large he can't move it? Um, can God create a secret that he can't know it? All of, all of these little tricks are, are sort of tricks within the relationship between an agent and arena. And what's posited in the joke is an arenic aspect of boulder so large it cannot be moved. That's an arenic aspect. And then the agent has to therefore act upon that item in there. And in that sense, the metadivine realm is in fact at the top of the hierarchy. 
and Christians for a long time have said these questions basically mean nonsense, but we haven't really asked why are they nonsense? Well, you know, they've played around with it. I think actually this way into it helps. And I mentioned in my, a couple of videos ago, or my last video about, you know, why I'm still a Protestant, is this radical freedom of God. And in this sense, the, the, the way to have the most radical, a God of the most radical freedom, is in fact to have a God like Kaufman imagines, not a God like the pagans imagined. Here's the video, uh, Lecture 2, Hebrew Bible and Ancient Near East Setting. This video was um, given to me by one of you in the comment section a long time ago, and once I got it, it was like, wow. And then I bought this book. I got it cheaply used on Amazon. And after I mentioned it, a few of you, a few of the others of you went out and bought it, and now it's crazily priced on Amazon. Sorry about that. All right, and I'll be my usual um, obnoxious self and butt in on what he has to say with some commentary. Does life have a meaning without God? Can life be meaningful without God and without eternity? Now, which God? God number one, God number two. Now again, all along I've never said there are two gods. Paganism, in a sense, says there are more than two gods. One sort of God is the metadivine realm, often tried to be represented in the fates, let's say. The second is all of the gods that act within that realm. Now, if you look at Verveke's four Ps, you know, there's procedural, or there's propositional, and he's going to address the propositional. Then there's the perspectival. And, of course, in the Awakening from the Meaning Crisis community, they've talked a lot about the perspectival. And what he's really going to do is, is set some of Verveke's Ps against each other. In many ways, when you talk about trust, so here are Verveke's four Ps, propositional, procedural, perspectival, and participatory. Peterson has issues with the propositional. Now, propositionality and this working on propositionality is a big issue in modernity. And so when Peterson begins Maps of Meaning and says there's two ways to conceptualize the universe, one is a world of action, and the other is a world of objects. In some way, action is perspectival, procedural, and participatory, whereas objects are sort of propositional or propositionalized. And so when you listen to Peterson here, you're going to watch him talk about, these, talk about these elements. Okay, let's go back. Well... <clears throat> And without, does life have a meaning without God? Can life be meaningful without God and without eternity? Well, <clears throat> at the highest and most abstract levels, perhaps not. So, I mean, life has proximal meanings, right? There's the meaning that you experience when you're engaged in a piece of art. Now, now, part of the question of meaning is the question of experience. And this gets into some of C.S. Lewis's uh, little book, The Abolition of Man, because part of what Lewis contends is that the new wave of education that Lewis is complaining about in the middle of the 20th century says that the waterfall following Coleridge, that the waterfall is pretty, whereas Coleridge says it's sublime. In other words, Lewis is using more of a medieval posture to say that the things of this world can be looked through in order to see um, what they really are. And obviously there's some Platonism in there as well. So the question that, that we have about meaning is when we experience meaning, are we seeing through to something are we experiencing something beyond ourselves, or is it simply the fact that we are having an emotional experience and that's all there is? It's just an emotional experience that this, this experiential sense um, is perhaps useful or adaptive for things in this world, and that's as far as they go. Or are they useful and adaptive for things in this world because they are actually getting at deeper things. And this gets into all kinds of questions about um, 
experience and reality. Think about Donald Hoffman and hacks and cheats and whether truth prior to a number of years ago, it was imagined that, well, Darwinian truth gets at something true because there's something beneath it. And those who know the truth better will survive. Donald Hoffman, in a sense, comes along and says, no, that's not true. There are tricks and hacks. That doesn't really necessarily resolve the question. And so for Jordan Peterson, meaning is something like a gyroscope in the world. And proximal is an excellent word in that question of a gyroscope because part of the problem of modernity, says someone like Charles Taylor, is that we are buffered. And um, the way I often conceptualize that buffer is the iron box of modernity. We can't see out and see the stars, so we're sort of left to our own devices. There cannot be, there's only emergence from below. There cannot be emanation from above. And therefore, we're sort of stuck with what we have. And Peterson comes along and says, well, I don't know. I think meaning is gyroscopic. I think meaning can give us indicators of another world, of what is true at the highest of levels. And so now he's working that when he's talking about proximal meanings here. Art or life has proximal meanings, right? There's the meaning that you experience when you're engaged in a piece of art or when you're reading or when you're engrossed in a movie or in a conversation. And, and okay, is that, are those just feelings or does that conversation, does that movie, does that piece of art, is it, is it simply a hack and a trick on us to, to, to gin up certain feelings that we have inside of us? Or are these messages from another world, let's say? And, and these are the kinds of issues that we're, we're wrestling with with this question of meaning. There's the meaning that emerges within your relationships with people that you cherish or are enthusiastic with. And that might be an even more interesting analogy because if in a relationship one person finds something meaningful and the other does not, what does that mean? Are we all sort of trapped in our own solipsistic, solipsistic buffered selves? Or can people actually connect over the divide between each other? And if so, is all of that only capable because there is somehow an individual shared meaning, or can there in fact be larger meanings that get built in, in terms of a culture and even biology by which people find that meaningful? And of course, Jordan Peterson's answer is yes. And a lot of the conversation that he had with Sam Harris actually gets into that. Jordan Peterson basically in that conversation tries to put together an argument, a long, you know, a, a fairly lengthy argument to say that all of human development in fact builds this into our world and into ourselves even at a biological level and as i described that conversation in some way jordan keeps trying to build this argument and i think sam just kept keeps it's imagine two kids in a playroom jordan's trying to build a tower and sam just keeps knocking it over and that's sort of how those conversations went and that's i think part of why those conversations were in some way frustrating there's meanings of security and predictability uh there's meanings of duty and responsibility and active engagement with your job and your career. And, and so those might be, when we participate in them, we might find them emotionally rewarding and experientially rewarding. And, and Peterson makes a compelling point that this sense of meaning is higher than the sense of happiness. It's even higher in, in some cases and in some of us than our our sense of survival, meaning is that powerful in us. And so I think in some ways, Peter, within Peterson, there's an ontological argument that if this is so powerful within us, mightn't it just be the case that it in fact does connect to something transcendent, to something greater? Um, there's meanings of aesthetic pleasure. Now, all of those have their value and each of them has their place. And, you know, maybe there's a hierarchy of value there as well, so that some of those meanings are deeper than others. And then you might say, well, what characterized the deepest of all meanings? And it would be something like relationship with the transcendent, and that would establish a relationship between you and 
what's always been conceptualized as God, which is generally supposed to be something ineffable, right? It, it's not definable, but you might think about it as the central animating spirit of the age or the value around which all other values are organized or the now, now there's just a ton in there so we're gonna have to go back and go through that more carefully but right away when i first started listening to peterson i i always sensed that there was something of the ontological argument that was sort of lurking beneath him and i think you see this in this formulation of his answer that he's a modern man in many ways and so he tries to stay within those limits. He tries to limit when he says, I'm speaking scientifically, I'm speaking as a psychologist. Now, in terms of modernity, all of that is public knowledge. And then he's he has a right to private experience and private religion. And Peterson, more than most, even though everybody hammers him at it, um, sort of keeps that private over to the side. And, and in some cases, it sort of acts like we're intruding on his privacy when we keep pestering him about these questions. The problem is he's just so tantalizing about these tantalizing about these questions that they, they they simply lead into them as even rationality rules and destiny noted in his in that rationality rules Jordan Peterson smuggling smuggling video. But what he just got into here is important because this gets into the whole God number one, God number two thing. The wage defined is not deeper than others hierarchy of value there and each of them has their place and you know maybe there's a hierarchy of value there as well and, and so here's you know you're sort of knocking on the door of the ontological argument there so that some of those meanings are deeper than others and of course when deeper than others there's a conceptualization of this and we're you know exaptation as verveki would say we're using our experience of a three-dimensional world to give metaphor for trying to understand so how some things are dependent on others in a purely theoretical space. And again, you can look at C.S. Lewis's book, Miracles, when he talks about the fact that we have no other way of talking about these things, but with uh, metaphors that are from this three-dimensional, very concrete world. And then you might say, well, what characterized the deepest of all meanings? And it would be something like relationship with the transcendent. Okay, uh, the deepest of all. So, so again, it's sort of an ontological argument here. And then relationship. Well, once you go to relationship, you're really into, you're sort of outside of the propositional and you're inside of the procedural, the perspectival and the participatory. And I think that's where you really begin to get into both the fullness of God, which is God number one and God number two, these two aspects of God, both the agentic aspect of God and the arenic aspect of God, because quite obviously procedural perspectival participatory, these are we those those are ways in which we act like agents within an arena but we are also at the same time engaging with the arena. Now, some of you might have questions about God in his arenic sense, and I would point to many passages in the Bible that speak to that. One of the most interesting ones is when the Apostle Paul quotes a Stoic poet, poet in Athens, and he says, in him we live and move and have our being. That's very much a view of God as arena. There's the, the, the one I use often from Isaiah 6. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. That's God number two. The whole earth is full of his glory. That's God number one. One's arenic, one's agentic. And that would establish a relationship between you and what's always been conceptualized as God, which is generally supposed to be something ineffable, right? It, it's not definable, but you might think about it as the central animating experience spirit of the age or the now this agent arena relationship is interesting because we all live in situations in which our agency gets arenic let's say uncle sam has agency and it also gets arenic in the world um, gravity is very arenic 
but it seems to have agency when I drop, <laughs> I just dropped it all the way to the floor, when I drop a Sharpie. So, you know, we're playing with this idea, with these ideas a bit. The value around which all supposed to be something ineffable, right? It, it's not definable, but you might think about it as the central animating spirit of the age or the value around which all other values are organized. Okay, the central animating spirit of the age is a very interesting one because we've been talking about spirit quite a bit. And I think a big piece of what Jordan Peterson triggered is in fact, he began to make visible for people God number one. And there's a there's an arenic quality to spirit. And I think Jordan Peterson made that visible. And I think part of the reason why a good many people began wanting to go to church is because deep in their imaginations, even in a level below their conscious, the consciousness member of their consciousness congress, or maybe we'll have to redefine that even further, they, they sensed an opportunity. And again, Peterson also has this way of saying, oh, what we see are opportunities and obstacles. I, I use two O's just there for pastoral alliteration. But when we begin to see that possibility, we're drawn to it because we feel its power. We feel our emptiness. We feel our smallness. We see the potential and we're drawn to it. Maybe I'll just play this little bit of Rationality Rules video where I think um, I think Rationality Rules is, and this Destiny guy, whoever he is, is exactly right on Jordan Peterson here. And obviously they're big critics and in some ways set themselves up, uh, themselves up as adversaries of him because of course he is reinforcing this uh, outdated Iron Age myth that must die for all sorts of moral reasons. I did what I normally do while gaming. I listened to YouTube videos. And in this specific case, I listened to Destiny. And interestingly, he essentially voiced the criticism of Jordan Jesus smuggling, but in reference to politics. The problem with what Jordan Peterson does is Jordan Peterson makes a lot of descriptive claims, but he never makes any normative claims. So Jordan Peterson will say things like, women are not as happy today as they used to be. Um, women and men don't get along in the office. Um, men tend to be better at this thing. And then that's all he ever says. He never goes, he never takes a step further to make a prescriptive claim to say, like, what should we do about something? And the problem is a lot of people will take the things that he says and then they, like, jump to very bad places, kind of obviously. It's where you would expect someone to go um, based on what he said. But then he... It's, in it's interesting the presume normativity he has just laid in the middle of that st statement. But anyway. He never takes responsibility for any of the kind of normative leaps people make off of his descriptive ones. And that's kind of the annoying thing with dealing with... Jordan Peterson. And here, Destiny is, as he often is, bang on the money. Jordan doesn't necessarily smuggle bad ideas himself, but he facilitates an environment that makes it incredibly easy for others to do so. He doesn't say that women should fulfill the role of looking after children, but he does clear the path for those who do. Women shouldn't fulfill the role of looking after children? Shouldn't we all be looking after children? Aren't half of all of us women? Given this, the question is, how responsible is Jordan for the damage done by his rhetoric? How damage done. How much responsibility is on the cross on his back? Truth be told, I don't know. I'd like to know your thoughts, so you can let me know in the comments, but what is for certain is that he bears some responsibility. Jordan Peterson is not a Jesus smuggler, but he is a Jesus smuggler smuggler. Anyhow. As always, thank you kindly for the view, and an extra special thank you to my wonderful patrons. Okay, so we, we can leave his patrons off my video. But I think that's exactly right, because Jordan sets up this moment where he helps illuminate, he helps demonstrate the possibilities and the power of a relationship with God that he himself sort of just 
tries to stay over the line. He'll 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 describe the promised land, but at least in public, he'll sort of stay over the line. It's a very interesting dynamic. Organized or the wisdom of the ages or the creative spirit that possesses you when you're inspired or what grips you with enthusiasm at a sports event or at a musical event, all of those things. And we need a relationship with that. And now what he just said there is very interesting because on one hand, God for him is the spirit behind the spirits, which, which is a, something that's worth thinking more about. But in that sense, it's almost it's almost like Morpheus Morpheus's description of God in the Matrix. We find our deepest meaning in that relationship, and if we don't find it, I think if we don't find it in something that's explicitly religious, then we tend to magnify something of lesser value, say something political. And and again, this is a guy who doesn't go to church, which I did a video earlier about this is a guy who warns about the dangers of ideology and the protection from ideology. And I a hundred percent agree with what he's saying here. If you really want to not be ideological, be religious because you'll have a better shot at participating more fully in everything that religion has to do. And, and what is the, what is the potential what is the potential outcome of that? I think the potential outcome is that you will have a greater capacity. It doesn't mean that you'll achieve that potential, but you'll have a greater capacity for relationships that transcend the ideological frontiers of this world. And that might be one very interesting way of, descri of describing Jesus. Now, he was clearly killed by the collaboration of enemy not enemies to him, although they counted themselves that way, but even enemies to each other, killed by enemy ideological camps, also religious. And so religion is no guarantee against ide ideological possession of various sorts. But I would argue that the truer the religion, the more powerful resistance there is to ideological possession, ideological temptation, ideological seduction and again as i mean again the vision you get from rationality rules is jordan peterson constructs the stairway and stops right there and it's the truman show that walks through the door not jordan stays right there fascinating into that to fill the void so yes life has proximal meanings without God, without eternity, but at the ultimate level, something's lacking. And it's the desire to fulfill. And I think his audience hears that and says, he's right. I'm going to go get some of that. And here's Jordan just sort of holding the door open for them, <laughs> but standing on the outside. Maybe that's the role he's going to play. I mean, God bless him. But I, I step in the door with everybody else. Fill that lack that, and maybe the lack itself, that's part and parcel of the religious instinct. So you can kill God, but you can't. That doesn't rectify the hunger for God. Well, and I think that's, you can kill God number two, but I think the hunger for God in many ways comes from us often seeing God number one. I think in many ways, that's the, that's the nut, that's the kernel, that's the seed of what he calls the religious instinct. That, and, and, and it, and it tempts us in, and it itself tempts us in many ways. And I think in some ways, the temptation for it, you can find in Adam and Eve, the man and the woman in the garden, because they themselves would like to be God but you're not going to.
because there's the the arena is already set and you can't you can construct these little sub arenas and uh, when we do that faithfully it's a beautiful thing and i think that's when there's alignment and it's actually in in biblical terms you would say that the spirit of god working through you you can create them in rebellion adversarial arenas but then you're basically a rebel camp and my understanding of the spirit of god and how the spirit of god works is well something like the resurrection where well why is jesus the ideological enemy of all of those around him because basically the conceptualization is to one degree or another they're all rebel camps and jesus says you're all rebel camps I'm the only, it's, I mean, it's the most audacious thing as C.S. Lewis notes. I'm, no one gets to the Father except through me. I am the true representation of God. In fact, I am God. That's what Jesus says. I mean, again, it's it's completely understandable while people, while people will hear this and say, I just can't believe that. It's, I can understand that. Yeah, that's what Jesus claims. And and then we just puzzle, how how can that be? But the proof of that then is the resurrection. Because one of the things I've been thinking a lot about is, gosh, this is so hard to articulate. There are always about a half dozen videos in my head that I can't get out because I can't articulate them. And eventually they come, at least some of them. And one of the ones that I've been sitting on for a long time is this question of, it's it's in it's in the Bible called the divine passive. Basically means that if it happened, God did it. Now, that's very in keeping with an agentic and an agentic God. But the difficulty with that posture is sin. So in other words, if all there is 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 and there is no ought then is and ought are the same because there can't be anything else and there can't be any choice. But the Bible wants to say God is agent and arena, that powerful, that big, and yet there are rebellions. And that sets up the very hard question of can, can we actually have those two things side by side? Can God be all-powerful and can there be rebellion? In many ways, underneath this is the seed of the problem of evil. And in many ways, the Christian religion sort of sets that up, and the Jewish religion sets that up too. And you see that in the book of Job. But the divine passive basically, and, and, see, and I think Jesus is the resolution of this question. I think that's how the Bible intends, at least Christians intend to see Jesus. He's the resolution of the question. He's the resolution to the problem of Job. Because Job ends with Job placing his hand over his mouth. Because God basically saying, hey, you know, how much do you really know, little man? And Job is in some ways an Old Testament version of the perfect man. And then the question is, well, what happens to the perfect man? And Job is restored, sort of, but the one thing that can't come back to life at the end of the book of Job are, well, I guess you could say that the dead cows and or the stole the cows were stolen, but the but Job's dead children can't be brought back. And Jesus comes back. And so in that sense, it's a leveling up of the book of Job. And then that hunger seeks out replacements. That's how it looks to me. And that's idolatry. There's that hunger and it seeks out replacements because finally, if you recognize that the spots are all taken and you are A, too late, B, too insufficient, what is the only reasonable thing would be to get a, in a, into alignment 
with the God. Well, how do you do that? Well, and that's what religion is about. So, yeah, there's some commentary. I thought it was a, a really interesting question. And it's actually made interesting by the question before and the question and after, because as with my questions and answers, if you're sitting down and answering a lot of questions one after the other, you tend to pile them on top of each other. You tend to refer back and forth to them. They tend to bleed into one another. So there's the whole video there. Anyway, I hope this was helpful. Thanks for watching.